Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. <clears throat> and I want to start reading in verse number 1. Colossians 3, verse number 1. <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which, were, which are above, where Christ sitteth, on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you are dead, and <clears throat> your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall all, <clears throat> then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now, <clears throat> when we read this, this is scripture that we all know and, and feel the importance of. That if we are in Christ, which means if we are saved by God's grace, then our job is to seek the things that are above. Seek the things that are spiritual. Seek the things that are heavenly. Those are the things that we are supposed to seek, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me say this while we're talking about seeking those things. A quick reminder. I was just having a conversation yesterday with, um, <clears throat> with someone, a young lady, about some of the things that she was talking about, all the struggles and troubles and, and talking about... <clears throat> how people were viewing this situation and this situation. And I said, let me tell you, sometimes one of the, our greatest failures that we don't see as a failure right off is that lots of times the things we find are the things we're looking for. If you want to be like a vulture and an old buzzard and you want to search for dead, rotten things, that's exactly what you're going to find. But if you want to be like a hummingbird and you want to look for flowers and things that are pretty and nice and full of pollen that's going to help you and you want to be more positive, then those are the things you're going to find. So most of the time when we focus on the negative all the time, it's because it's what we're looking for. We're looking for the bad, not the good. We're looking for the pessimistic part, not the optimistic part. All right? So... <clears throat> That's one of the reminders that the Apostle Paul is giving us here is that we need to continually seek the things that are heavenly. Seek the things that develop your relationship with God. All right? That's what we need to do. Right before this, when you come to the end of chapter 2 in Colossians, <clears throat> what he's dealing with is a group of people who are saying, no, don't touch that, don't taste that, don't partake in that, because if you do, and what it was, it was an idea of about food they were eating, things they were doing, hanging on to the legalistic side of religion. And he called it, <clears throat> um, when we have our will religion, okay, when we make religion up at our own will, according to what we want it to be, and it's like, oh, well, you can't do it this way, and you can't do it that way, and we get all focused on <clears throat> ordinances, rules, and regulations, and it's like, well, because I am a Christian, I cannot participate in that, I cannot do this, and I cannot do that. Because I am a Christian, I, I must not be a part of this or that. Now, I'm not talking about just worldly things. I'm saying people who are so focused on, well, <clears throat> baptism has to happen this way. The church service has to be run exactly this way. Only a certain group of people are allowed to say things or do things in this manner. If we get too wrapped up in for instance, bylaws of a church. Because the bylaws of a church are, yes, there to help rule and govern 
the body, us, so that we can do things that are right, orderly, in a fashion according to Scripture. But most bylaws of a church are written by men. They're not written by God. They're written by men. So when we get too wrapped up in those legalistic things, then it we get so focused on what we can't do and be a part of that we lose the ability to grow in a relationship with God and focus on the right point. Okay, If you spend all your time saying, we have to stand and fight against all this oppression, okay, for an instance. Here is something that's in the news a lot here lately. If we want to stand, an abortion <clears throat> is against God. It is against Scripture, right? period. Whether people like it or whether they don't like it, it's scripturally unsound, all right? Homosexuality, whether people like it or don't like it, it's scripturally unsound. Not because I said so. Not because you said so. Because God said so. Now, does that mean that we hate people who have been through those situations? Do you hate a person who's had an abortion? Absolutely not. Do you hate a homosexual? Absolutely not. That's not scriptural. That's not what God teaches. The act, uh, the sin itself, is against God. The sinner is the one that Jesus Christ died for. So the love is different. The reaction is different. But we don't treat it that way. We separate the sinner with the sin instead of the sin from the sin. And when you get focused on those areas, and if you say, okay, then our job as Christians is to stand against all these horrible things. And to stand against all sin in general, and that becomes your focus, then you've lost focus. Because it's not about focusing on a sin or sinful things in general. Right? This is not something we always hear, but this is what God is teaching us. Right? It's not about focusing on those things. It's about seeking a stronger relationship with God. We get so focused on what we can't do and what we shouldn't do that we forget to continue to seek spiritual, heavenly things, a stronger relationship with God. We get so focused on the idea of, well, I can't be seen as this or I can't be seen as that, that we forget to grow in God. Because when you grow in God, those things take care of themselves. You are a better person because you have a stronger relationship with God. The more you read and study the Word, the more knowledge you have. The more knowledge you have, the more ability you have to answer questions in a positive scriptural way. Not because it's your idea, it's your opinion, but because it's what God said. All right? So <clears throat> the whole point is, is how much time have you truly spent on developing your relationship with God? Because that's what takes care of the other problems. That's what gives us the foundation of standing on what is right and what is true. And then it allows people to ask the questions and to start asking questions and more questions, right? And as I said, <clears throat> one of the greatest questions that you can ever get lost people to ask you is who is Jesus Christ? One of the greatest places to go. And even if they don't ask me that question and I'm talking to someone, that I know is seeking the Lord or that the Lord has touched their heart in some form and given them the convictions that they need to come to Him. Right? <clears throat> One of the first things I did is I always say is let me tell you who Jesus Christ is. And it's not just about Jesus. All right? Remember, it's Jesus Christ. 
Why is it so important to add Christ on to Jesus when we're talking about him? Because Christ makes him risen. Christ makes him our Lord. Christ makes him our Savior. He is a risen Savior. And that's the part that we focus on. But who is Jesus? The first question that we ask. Who is Jesus? Jesus is life. Period. He is the creator. All right? The first thing that we have to present to the world is Jesus Christ as the creator. Colossians chapter number one, we're right here in chapter three, but you can go back over in chapter one, and it's very plain that he spoke everything into existence. Why? It goes all the way back to John. When John wrote in John chapter one, verse number one, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, and the word was made flesh, and the wealth of us. That's Jesus Christ. All right? So <clears throat> if he was in the beginning and he was the word and the word was God, then that means that Jesus Christ was God. He is the creator. And it's perfect. All right? He is the word of God. He is the mouth of God. He is the one that spoke the world into existence. <clears throat> Number one, that makes him God. God came in the flesh. Why? Because only God can pay a debt. That his created beings ran up, which was sin. All right? Now, <clears throat> so when we start to think about Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world. Why? And everybody always likes to go back and refer to John 3.16. You know, one of the greatest pieces of Scripture that even lots of lost people know and can quote. And that's fine. Let's go there. For God so loved the world, the lost, those that were against him. The ones in darkness. The ones that are still dead to Christ. Right? The ones who have no relationship with God. Because how was our relationship with God cut and severed? Through sin. Because of that, our relationship with God was cut off. We have no relationship with God without Jesus Christ. But because of Jesus Christ, he is the one who has restored our relationship with God, who has reconciled us. And we all know what it means to reconcile. If you have an argument with somebody and you get in that argument and you're back and forth, but all of a sudden you kiss and make up and you get over your <laughs> argument, you have reconciled one with another. All right? It is a restored relationship with God that only happens through Jesus Christ. And then he has given us, as it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.18, not only has he reconciled us, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That once we become saved, then we have something that we have the ability to share. What do we have the ability to share? The love of God. The love of Jesus Christ. A God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, which was a hint it didn't mean it was just his only son. It wasn't just the idea of being the only son. The only begotten, we find in 1 Corinthians 15, is a reference to the resurrected Lord, the resurrected Jesus Christ, the first begotten of the dead. All right? So he raises him and gives him as a sacrifice to pay the debt 
for all. Not just me, not just you, not just your neighbor, but the entire world. Jesus Christ died for all. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anybody, that believes in him should not perish, which means that you are continually separated from God. No relationship whatsoever. No hope whatsoever. No ability to overcome other than your own. And you say, I don't need anybody but myself. That's a lot of the times those are the things we get. I am strong enough in myself. I have a good education. I've got money. I've got the things I need. I can do it myself. Those are the people who fall the hardest because they end up becoming selfish, self-centered people who get focused on only themselves and could care less about the world. And that's the reason that we're in the situations that we're in in the United States today is because we have become a selfish nation that is focused on itself and not on growing in God. But anyway, what we find is that these people who tend to, to get in this way and they say, I can do it all on my own. I don't need any help. Never get to the realization that they're stuck, that they're lost, that there's no way that they're ever going to get to where they need to go without fixing their relationship with God and without a Savior. If you don't realize that you're dangling off a cliff, if you don't realize that you're in danger, then you don't think you ever need a Savior. But I promise you, if you slip and you're holding on by your fingertips and you're yelling, help, help, you realize you need a Savior. The first aspect of any salvation is to realize that you don't have the relationship with God that you should. So how do I fix that? Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he didn't want anybody to perish, but everybody to have everlasting life. And everybody starts to think, well, God doesn't love me because he's just going to punish me. But verse 17 of John 3 says the exact opposite. He said he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Jesus Christ, could be saved. Not killed, saved. So <clears throat> then we go on, and you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, where he says, this is the gospel which we preach. And wherein we stand. This is the gospel that we preach. This is the gospel that we stand on. Verses 3 and 4, what is the gospel? That Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That's our gospel. <clears throat> Once you believe it, then you can be saved by God's grace. He doesn't add any other stipulations to it. He simply says, believe it. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. <laughs> Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. And what does it go on to say? That repents and is baptized to everyone that gets their name in a church role, to everyone that focuses on one area of life to everyone that works really hard. No. He simply said to everyone that believes. But you see, believing is different. It's not just saying <coughs> everybody can go around and say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe there's a God. <coughs> I believe there's some higher power in the world that has authority to do those things. Absolutely, I believe it. 
That's not the belief that God's talking about in the Scripture. Lots of people may believe things. Mm -hmm. But true belief is true faith. It removes doubt. If you really believe it, then there's no doubt in your mind. That's the believing that we're talking about. All right? That's the believing that is scriptural. It's like <clears throat> Jesus Christ died for my sins because God said so in his word. I didn't see it. I didn't see Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. I didn't see Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ resurrect from a tomb. I never saw it with my own eyes. Never did I see it. But I believe it without a doubt. I never doubt the idea of what Jesus Christ did. Why? Because I know he loved me. I know he loved me because God said so in his holy word. There is no doubt in my mind. There is no doubt in my mind that Jesus Christ is coming back. There is no doubt in my mind he is coming soon. Look around us. How can you deny? The other day, Dad was talking about how there were <clears throat> all these multiple earthquakes that were happening in South Carolina. South Carolina. Earthquakes. Yeah, I know we had one here not too long ago, little tremors that come through and all that. And, and we're feeling them. And it's like, you know, we see things happen that is fulfilling of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And Jesus tells us, he said, no, in the last days. And in the last days is before Jesus Christ returns. Before the tribulation starts, he says, know that in those last days, perilous times are coming. Jesus Christ himself said that brother would turn against brother, <coughs> son against mother, daughter against father. People are going to turn on one another. There is no love. There is no family unit. There is no care anymore. It starts to be broken, and it starts to crumble. And when it does, Jesus Christ said, watch, watch, because this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of the horrible things that are coming. That's scripture. I believe it with every ounce of my being. So <clears throat> when we see that, then that believing aspect is what removes that, right? And there's lots of us who go through times when we will go through times and we wonder, well, I've done some things that aren't right or maybe I haven't grown in my relationship to God. And the first way that Satan attacks you is to make you question your relationship with God. But if you're continually growing in that relationship, you won't question something that you see something that you can feel, something that you know is real because it's God in you. If you've ever had a little taste of God in you, if you know what it is, everybody says, well, I can remember the exact day and time and everything that happened when I got saved by God's grace. That's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. I hope you can. But is it important that you remember the date, the time, the place? No, it's not important. What's important is that you remember what it felt like when you got saved by God's grace. Because if you can't remember what it felt like, if that feeling is not different from any feeling you've ever had in your life, you've never had it. Because it is different, unique. It is peaceful joyful. It is life-giving, and you realize it. So, who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is life. Last week, we talked about having more than enough. More than enough. All right? <clears throat> Back in St. John 10, verse 10, what did he say? He said, thieves come for the purpose to steal, kill, and destroy. That's their purpose. But Jesus Christ said, I didn't come to be a thief. I didn't come to take something from you. I didn't come into the world to condemn you, as we saw in John 3, 17. 
He said, I didn't come to steal, kill, or destroy. He said, I came to give you life. And not only give you life, but to give it to you more abundantly. So that you could have more than enough. Jesus Christ is life. <clears throat> Romans 6, 23, what does it say? Everybody should know this. If you don't, you should mark it. You should memorize it. Memorize it because this is extremely important. For the wages of sin, your payment for sin is death. The wages of sin is death, but but, that simple little three-letter word. But, the gift of God. Now, a gift is something you don't work for. You don't earn it. It is simply given to you. Without any uh, <clears throat> understanding that you need to give something back, without any expectation of returning that's not the way we expect gifts now. It's like at Christmas time, you get a gift, you know, and then everybody feels bad. It's like, oh, you gave me a gift. Well, I didn't get you one. Because it's all about the exchange. Jesus Christ never asked for an exchange. Not one. You say, well, he tells me that he wants me to follow him. He tells me that he wants me to, <coughs> you know, live a good life. He wants me to develop a relationship. So yeah, he expects something in return. No, he didn't expect anything. He simply said, if you love me, do it. If you love me enough and you realize what I have given you as a gift, then you should. But you don't have to. He still loves you. He didn't require you to do it. It's not a requirement. Because what he gave you is a gift. The gift of salvation. It is the gift of God. Huh? <clears throat> this gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, our Lord. Huh? So who is Jesus? Jesus is life. The bottom line is Jesus Christ is life. That's who he is. That's what he is. That's what he's done. Oh, yeah, all the forgiveness that came, it comes because he is a life giver. He has forgiven you, and because of that forgiveness, you have life, eternal life. Because he has forgiven you and given you life, that means that you have been redeemed. The price has already been paid. You don't have to pay it. He paid it. <clears throat> it's like if you buy a brand new car and they tell you, okay, this brand new car costs this much money, you're going to have to pay $500 a month for the next six years of your life. And that's what it's going to be. But yet the next day, the bank calls you and says that somebody came in and paid your car off and they're sending you the title, and you don't owe a dime. The car is now yours. It's the same thing Jesus Christ did with your life. He already paid for it. He already has forgiven you. You are forgiven. And if you believe that Jesus Christ has done that for you, and you are saved by God's grace, then you understand that what you have been rewarded with is not punishment, not a beat down, not condemnation. What he's given you is life. That's who he is. <clears throat> and in verse 4, right here in Colossians 3, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, he says, then we will appear with him in glory. Why? Because he has given you life eternal. He hasn't separated you from him. He has made you a part of him. 1 Corinthians 
chapter 12, verse 12, where the body has many different parts, many members, it says, but it's only one body in Christ. With Jesus Christ as the head of that body, he is our life. So if he is our life, there's four things quickly that I want you to see that he truly is. He is our source of life. And I chose fancier words for this because I think it's just, it's so important that we understand who he is. All right? He is our source of life. What is the source of life? It is the beginning. Okay, That's to put it simple. Without him, there is no beginning. There is no beginning of life. You may live in this world. But when you live in this world, <clears throat> without Christ, you are dead. There is no hope. Without Christ, you are dead. Ephesians 2, 1. What does he say? And you hath he quickened, you he has given life. He said, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You he gave life. When you were dead. And then he goes on down in chapter 2 to talk about how we walked according to the course of the world, the way that they were setting things. We walked in the manner of the world, the way that they were living. <clears throat> and that's who we were, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, doing what we wanted to do, living the way we wanted to live. But then in verse 5, it says, but. But God, who is rich in mercy, and his love with which he loved us, or wherewith he loved us, with that love, he says, by grace are you saved. Because of his love and because of his undeserved kindness, you are saved by God's grace. And then in verse 8, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, because you believe. And it removes all doubt. Through faith. And it says, that not of yourselves. It didn't have anything to do with you. It all came from him. It's by his grace. And then it goes on in verse 9, saying, unless people want to boast, people want to brag, that's not what it's about. Because if it was about you, then you'd go around and say, look at what I did to earn heaven. Look at how much I did to get to where I need to. Heaven would be a horrible place. Can you imagine walking up and down the streets of glory, having to listen to somebody brag about how they got there all the time? Oh, let me tell you what I did to get here. No, thank you. Because it has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the beginning of our life. <clears throat> He is the beginning. And then <clears throat> he is the substance of our life. Think about it. Substance. What is the substance? Oh, let's go to the scientific term of substance. That probably fits better than just thinking about the substance of it. All right? When you think about the scientific idea of a substance, a substance is a matter or a material in which anything that exists exists. It's made up of some, some type of substance. Okay, The pews you're sitting on, they may have the little padded cushions in the carpet, but the thing that they're made out of is wood. All right? So <clears throat> when we stop and think about it, the substance of the pew is the wood. It's what makes the pew exist. Without wood, it doesn't exist, which means you're sitting on air which means you're about to fall on the floor. But because of that, that substance and that material, <clears throat> we have a pew. But it started with the simpleness of a tree growing somewhere and providing that wood. So <clears throat> what we learn is that Jesus Christ is the substance of life. He is that material that matter in which everything that deals with Christianity, true believing Christians, is built. 
It is built on him. He is the head of the body. We are the body of Christ. Every part of the body has a different use. But without the head, the rest of the body doesn't function. You cut the head off. The body dies. So <clears throat> with Christ, he is that functioning part of the body. It is because of him that we even exist in this world. His existence gave us existence. Because who were we before? We were dead. Now, we should be dead to sins, which means that we should be able to remove and separate ourselves from the temptation of sin. Can we? No. Do we? No. Because we <clears throat> give in to our own desires. But it's not because he hasn't given you the power. Because he exists in you and for you and it is because of him that you exist because remember that even if you live this entire life in this world and you live to be 120 years old without Christ at the end of that 120 years you are still dead there is no life the only way to have life is through Jesus Christ because he is life. He's the only one who holds life. He's the only one that knows life. He is the substance of our life. The next thing we learn is that he is the sustenance of our life. We all know what sustenance is. It's like getting food. That's what everybody thinks about because we all like to eat. So everybody likes sustenance, you know. I want food. But the whole idea of sustenance is provision, being the provider. Right? One of the things we learned in the Old Testament with the seven I am's of the Old Testament is that the one time when he is talking to Moses and he says that he is Jehovah Jireh, which is the provider. God the provider. And that's who he is. He is the one that makes sure that we have those necessities that we need. Greatest place to go is in John chapter 6, verse 50, 51. You can look at that when Jesus Christ tells us he is the bread of life. In uh, verse 50, that has come down from heaven. But then in verse 51... He says, I am the living bread. And at the end of the verse, he said that everybody who eats of that bread gets everlasting life. Because he is that one who provides for us every one of our necessities, the things that are necessary for us to exist. Now, in life, what is necessary for you to exist in life? You have to have body function. Okay, Your heart has to work. Your brain has to work. <clears throat> your blood has to flow right. Everything has to work together to be able to give you an abundant life. And he said, I provide you all the necessities that you'll ever need in life because I am your provider. Jesus Christ is the provider of life by giving you every necessity that you need to continue to live. He is the breath of life. He is the heartbeat of life. He is the head or the brain function of life. He is the arms that is the action of life. He is the, he are, he is the legs and the feet that give you the movement that you need through life to accomplish for him, he is life. 
And he is providing you everything that you need to accomplish true life. Living. <clears throat> Think about how precious it is to be a child of God and knowing that we have the ability to live. Live. And we get that through this, and then I'm on hush. But he, he talks about being the solace of life. Having solace in something. What's he talking about? Having comfort in times of trouble. Psalm 63, verse 3. And I looked at a bunch of verses when I was studying this. And this is the one the Lord kept bringing me back to. Psalm 63, verse 3. He says, because your loving kindness is better than life. He says, my lips will praise thee. My lips are going to praise you because your loving kindness that is better than life. What's he talking about? What is that loving kindness? You say, oh, that he loves us and that he cares for us. It's deeper than that. We need to understand the deepness of God's thinking and how powerful it is. Because of his tender, loving care and because he wants to do for you what is good. Which comes with being benevolent and having benevolence, which is doing a good thing. Something that is set aside for the purpose of doing good. So what he's telling us is that in his loving kindness, Toward us, his whole intention is that nothing happened to you but good. And you say, well, preacher, that's malarkey because <clears throat> I have plenty of bad things that happen in my life. We sure do. Absolutely. Every one of us have bad things happen in their lives. Every one of us. Is that because God brought it on you? Nope. You see, we tend to say, well, I believe in God. And if God is life, and God is going to give me in a good life, and then, then I should never have any troubles or struggles. That's not what he said either. He actually said the opposite. He said to live in this world is going to be full of persecution. It's going to be full of troubles. It's going to be full of trials. It's going to be full of heartaches. But he said, I'm life. And the life that I give you, it's better than that. It doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. We have problems in the world because there is sin in the world. Because there is wickedness in the world. Because there is evil in the world. Because there is darkness in the world. Because sin brought in disease and pestilence and pain. Not God. Man brought that on themselves. God didn't. We did. We did because we sinned. What did God do? He didn't come into the world to condemn it and to punish it. Why did he come into the world? What did we read? That's scripture. That's what God said. He said he came to, gave it, to give it life. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save it. How did he save it? By giving it life. The wages of sin, your payment for being in that part of the world, is dead. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is life. That's who he is. He is the beginning of our life. And he is what we are made up out of when we get saved by God's grace. He is who we are. And that's who we should be. Because he is your life. It is because of him you function. It is because of his sustenance, because of his provision that you have. And it is because of his comfort, his peace, that we have hope. And all that comes because he offers life. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's who he is. Now, how many times do we stop and think, who is Jesus Christ to me? What am I doing for Jesus Christ? 
or because I am saved by God's grace. Oh, how safe I am. When do we stop and think that? Instead of we start thinking, well, uh, all the horrible things are going to happen. Something else is going to come. I saw this morning COVID numbers are shooting back up and all that kind of stuff. And it's like everybody starts to panic. Where's our peace? I'm not saying don't be safe, don't be smart, don't use good sense. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about <clears throat> where is our peace? We panic and we focus on the negative instead of being able to look back and say, in the overall scheme of things, no matter how bad it gets tomorrow, I'm safe. Why? Because I'm in the hands of God. I'm living because he lives. I have life because he gave it to me. I have hope for tomorrow, no matter what tomorrow brings. I have hope because I have life, and they can't take that away. Because no matter what happens, if the world ends tomorrow, I still have life in Christ for eternity. Because I am in him. And how honored are we to be a child of God? It should be an honor that we feel. We should feel honored that Jesus Christ loved us enough to die for us. We should feel honored that he gave everything for us. But are we? We should be joyful with who we are. Are we? We should be those Christians who go around every day celebrating life in Christ, a risen Savior. We don't serve a God that is dead. We serve a God that is living. We don't live in a fairy tale world. We live knowing that our Savior is alive and has given us life. That's who we are. That's why we're different from the world. Because not only do we have the ability to seek the things that are above, and remember, seek them. You go out looking for heavenly things. You go out desiring to grow in God every day because you read his word, because you study it with every ounce of your being. Because you spend your time in prayer, because you do the things that are necessary to grow in God, doesn't mean you stop living the rest of your life. It means that you live the rest of your life in Christ. That your thoughts <clears throat> are not consumed with the horrors of the world, but with the greatness of Scripture. That you're not downtrodden by the horrors of the news, but that you know that you have hope in Jesus Christ. We should be honored. We should feel safe. We should be joyful in knowing who we are. Remember what Paul said? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Who are? I can tell you one thing. If you're saved by God's grace, you have life. And the only way you have that life is through Christ. He's the only one that can give it to us. Every head bowed and eye closed. <clears throat> you need to ask yourself the question. You need to search your own heart. And don't be afraid to search deep. Do you remember what it felt like when you got saved by God's grace? Did you remember what it felt like to take your first living spiritual breath as someone who was saved by God's grace? Because if you don't, and you don't remember what it felt like to be saved, then you don't have it. Because I promise you that's a feeling you never forget. Never. So if you're here this morning and you don't know what it is to feel that feeling, I'm going to ask you, slip your hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me. One anywhere. I hope and pray everybody here is saved by God's grace. And if you are, then you know that you have life. You have life. Think about that life. 
Think about how important that life is. And right here this morning, let's pray. God, use our lives. Let us live. Let us live and grow in you and become spiritual and stronger. Let's pray it together. Father, as we come to you this day, God, we pray that as we come to you, Lord, that you would help us to live. Live strong. Lord, live in your word. Live in your service. Because we love you, God. We are willing to live for you. Lord, we thank you for the life that you've given. We know that without our Savior, there is no life. We know that without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. But with him, we have all those things. God, we pray that we could go out and continue to share this life-giving message to those that are lost. That we would live as a life-giving message, Lord. That we would have that ministry of reconciliation that you would have us to have so that we can go out and accomplish your will. Lord, grant us these things. Help us to live for you and ever follow your will and we'll give you the honor and glory because we know we have life in you and because of you and we ask it all in Jesus name Amen <clears throat> anybody got a word testimony 